What's going on with y'all? You are now tuned into the Bobby Keith Podcast, episode 120. Sending y'all peace, love, and positivity, humans, aliens, other. All are welcome to enjoy the vibrations that are transmitted into this microphone. Somehow computed through technology and put into your phone. You feel me? Microphone, your phone. That, that's probably a homophone, right? <laughs> Something that sounds similar, same thing. Anywho, we are recording live. My YouTube audience can see the difference. Maybe my audio audience can hear the difference. Travel microphone equipped. We're in Garden City, New York. Some Long Island shit, you know what I'm saying? We on the island. It's Christmas Day I'm recording. It's the only way it kind of worked out with the schedule. Dip down here to see a bunch of Taw's family. This literal window, Christmas Day afternoon, was the best time for me to record this episode. So that's what we doing. Just watch the Sixers get a good W. It's a good day thus far. Hopefully I get to catch most of this Mavericks-Lakers game after this. But hey, how y'all doing? Y'all had a good holiday week. I hope so. I certainly have thus far. Kind of processed. What all the holidays mean to me and how to move forward into a new light with it, which is fun. Uh, moving forward in life is always fun because <laughs> you got to do it. So I'm happy to have been accepted by Tall's family into a new sort of holiday celebration. Really fun. We did that last night. Whole bunch of good stuff. Super grateful to be there. But now we move on, on to the next holidays. We got New Year coming up, eighth night of Hanukkah is tomorrow. It's the end of the celebration. Um, I mean, as someone who wasn't raised Jewish at all, obviously not Jewish at all, and I'm not going to convert, but I married a Jewish woman, so I'm learning more about the culture, more about all this stuff. Um Hanukkah ain't even like a real deal major celebration. I think we've talked on that before on this show, but it's like one of the low tier ones. <laughs> like it ain't really all that, but it just happens to fall in the line of consumerism. Christmas time, consumer Christmas, you know what I'm saying? December. It just happens to line up with that every single year. And this year, it even lines up with the exact day. Today's Christmas, also the seventh night of Hanukkah. So just learning more about that, what it was, essentially, I mean, this is going to be the worst butcher of the story ever. Don't cancel me. I ain't Kanye. I ain't Kyrie. (laughs) I love the Jewish people straight up. And I'm not denouncing any of it. I'm just saying this is my interpretation of it. And I know it's going to be butchered. But basically, a town, we're talking olden times, got ransacked. Different occupiers, different uh, empires came through and did their thing to the Jewish people. Essentially took over their towns and stuff. One, One of those regimes had just left, I believe, And at a temple or somewhere important, they were trying to piece the city back together, essentially. And this could be wrong. This could be so wrong. So do not take what I'm saying with anything but a grain of that flaky sea salt. The good stuff, you know, the the stuff straight from the sea. But basically, they were trying to make it so they could see. Because we're talking about olden times. Like, there was no electricity. You know what I'm saying? Uh, The only electricity was (laughs) probably the mental electricity. Maybe there was some carpet electricity, you know what I'm saying? Maybe some people, you know when you rub your your socks on the carpet and then you touch something? I wonder if that happened back in the day and people were just like, nah, we got to kill them. That's a witch. (laughs) Like, think about it. Think about it. You just walk around, you have some sort of, maybe it's wool. I don't know when they started really messing around with wool, but maybe you have something. 
We're just walking around on a, a floor of the same sort of substance. And then you touch somebody, you, you shake your friend's hand or something like that. And there's an electric shock. I mean, they will probably send you to jail. <laughs> like, they will probably lock you up, <laughs> put you in front of the town on trial, and do you like they did Jesus, right? <laughs> but anyway, trying to see, light a candle. They only had enough of the oil to light the candle, this special oil to light the candle. It was supposed to last one night and ended up lasting eight. And that's like the story. <laughs> I, I know I'm butchering it, making it sound less than it is, but like honestly, it's not that it's not that serious as far as the traditions and holidays go. Uh, Tal and I watched an incredible stand-up special a couple months ago. It might have come out maybe a month ago. Ari Shafir. The special is literally called Jew, and go check it out if you haven't because it's it's absolutely hilarious. But he basically breaks down a lot of traditions, uh, a lot of things within the culture that outsiders wouldn't understand and just kind of breaks it down in a simple way but and if you're in the culture it's like even funnier because <laughs> you have all the inside references um like he went to uh he literally went to jerusalem to go to school like he's real deal and then he left and became a comedian uh and so he had an incredible special on it tall is cracking up i'm cracking up so go check that out if you if you uh <laughs> If you haven't yet, but I'm going to spoil one of the jokes. Apologies, Ari. But when he was talking about Hanukkah, it's basically like <laughs> he was explaining the nonchalantness of like what we call a miracle, essentially. It was like some dudes came in on on day three of the light still. And they're like, that candle still going? <laughs> it's still it's still lit. Nice. <laughs> and then they came back on, on day six. It's like, no way. It's still lit. <laughs> and then day eight, it's like, wow, this is this is pretty cool. <laughs> and now it's the bit like the biggest consumerism day, um, not day, but not eight nights that we outsiders relate to the Jewish culture. So I just find that fascinating. That it's really not even a big deal within the culture. It's a, it's it's definitely important, but I think a lot of like outsiders like myself kind of thought it was more important until you actually learned what it was. And it's like, oh, this is this is not as important. <laughs> but I'm having fun kind of merging um, both of these traditions together because it's more like traditions at this point as opposed to rituals or, uh, you know, real things attached to concrete belief systems in my mind. As far as like Christmas or introducing Hanukkah or really any major holiday that's somewhat been tied to a religious aspect, I like to frame it in the tradition and family gathering situation as opposed to anything ritualistic. Because the ritualistic stuff's kind of trippy. Um, like for instance, Passover. I've been going to a bunch of Passovers these past few years, and it's it's a ritual. Like you're really reading scripture in this particular order and yeah it, it may not be as serious at one family's gathering as another but like it's a it's a real deal ritual um but like i don't know stuff like christmas and I, i'm not attaching any sort of ritualistic uh i mean because think about it think about it like you're literally taking a gift from under the tree giving it to somebody and there's been all sorts of stories about where that comes from um People even related to psychedelic mushrooms, like they're saying that's where that whole tradition comes from. And that's why the themes and the colors are like red and green. Very interesting stuff. Go check out that story. I talked about it last year. Go check out last year's Christmas episode. So, I don't know, 50 before this, where 120 is in the 80s or maybe late 70s. So go check that out to hear the real story of that because I went in more in depth last year. But I just been I had a good I had a really good uh you know Christmas Eve celebration here and just uh kind of having a good time having a good time. <laughs> but more or less we're moving into the end of the year. Shoot, by the time the next episode comes out, we're going to be in the new year, 2023. And again, we've done episode on calendars like is it really the new year? 
I don't know. That just happens to be the system that we reside in. So we have to kind of adapt and make believe that it's the new year. If anything, we should have done something special on the 21st. You know what I'm saying? On the solstice. And apologies for not touching on the winter solstice. Um, last week. Yeah, it would have been last week. I should have talked about it. But, you know, shortest day of light in the year. Cool stuff astrologically. Move into uh, Capricorn season. I got a lot of Capricorns in my life. From my wife. Two of my good friends, to a lot of people I meet. A lot of people I meet also have a strong partner as a Capricorn. Like, it's just, I don't know, it just makes sense. Shout out to the Capricorns for real. And Sagittarius is, you know what I'm saying? And Scorpio. I mean, shout out to everybody, but you know what I'm saying? Capricorns are legit. And it's Capricorn season. So shout out to y'all. But what I'm saying is, <laughs> We really should be celebrating a new year like that. Probably should be doing it on the equinoxes. That would make more sense. Especially the shortest day of the year. All right. It's a new year now. Every day is going to be longer than the last one. I don't know. It's a, it's a thought. But then, like, all right, if December 21st. I don't know. I, I feel like... Th- I feel like we could adjust the calendar just a a little bit back so that lines up correctly. Yeah, I know it would mess up the holiday season. Consumerism probably has a lot to do with it if we're really thinking about it and being honest. Like, for example, if you're not following me, here's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say we can live in a a world where we are still ruled by this calendar situation, but maybe it lines up more correctly with an equinox. So for example, if we're talking about the winter one being the last day of the year, that wouldn't be too much of a change from what we currently exist in. Of course, it would be the summer equinox for those in the Southern Hemisphere. But luckily for the globe as a whole, a vast majority of the people live in the Northern Hemisphere. So there would be a minority that would have to have this day be the southern or the uh, the summer equinox. So their new year would start when the days get shorter as opposed to longer. Anyway, this is just a proposal. We're just talking it out. Loose proposal here. We could have the year end on the winter equinox. So, that, uh, for example, that would be 10 days calendar wise. Things would be pushed forward. Now, what happens? The traditional celebration of Christmas is going to be like the beginning of January. Now, they might move that forward. But like, I mean, I guess at this point, Christmas isn't attached to anything. It's just a day. It's a consumeristic day. Sometimes Hanukkah will be after. Uh, Sometimes Hanukkah would be after the new year. So it might be early January. But I don't think people really are stressing over that as much. I mean, the Jewish people are on their own calendar system, too. So they don't even worry about that. But I'm saying just for the Gregorian calendar that we all kind of abide by, we could end it on the winter equinox. And that would be pretty chill. I don't know. It seems like a good idea. A lot. Yeah, a lot would be affected. I get it. But come on. Christmas isn't really attached to the equinox anymore. And now it would just be a few a week before the equinox as opposed to a couple days after the equinox and shout out to equinox the gym straight up <laughs> Would love to check it out i'm currently looking out this beautiful window on the fourth floor of this incredible hotel and i'm looking and i see lifetime fitness now lifetime fitness is i compare it to like the whole foods of the gym world and i'm at the ymca you know what i'm saying that's that uh <laughs> That's that value bin. That's that uh you know that that uh shop right, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> now lifetime, that's Whole Foods. And it comes it comes with a price tag. That's what it is, you know? I was actually researching last week. I swear I'll connect the circle. Don't worry, just follow this thread. 
trying to understand my mind. This is how it works. I know the objective. We'll get to the objective, but we gotta follow a thread if if we see it. You know what I'm saying? If an indigo thread gets woven, ooh, that third I gotta follow it. You know what I'm saying? Last, <laughs> I was looking up Lifetime Fitness because I drove by one that's relatively near where I live, like 30 minutes away. I'd been to one. You can go listen to the episode of the road trip took to Houston. Talked about the experience at a Lifetime Gym. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. It's like super luxury. But I've heard Equinox is even a step above that. Now, I'm not sure if they have basketball courts like Lifetime does. But Equinox, I mean, taking the name of a universal event and making it into a business, that's pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful stuff. Harnessing that energy and turning it into the most successful luxury gym business probably in the world shout out to them shout out to the creators of equinox for real lifetime fitness though on the other hand is pretty expensive still though it's like 220 dollars for a month membership not really worth it at this current moment in my life but i aspire to have a lifetime fitness membership because <laughs> it's worth it if you go every day i think i mean the amenities in there are ridiculous. The equipment's top of the line. Personal training, NBA size basketball courts. I could go on and on. Free ads for them. It makes sense though. This this episode's coming up on New Year. A little gym talk. People love the gym for New Year. <laughs> it's probably the most popular gym topic week in the world. Is New Year, right? <laughs> so let's stick on it for a second. Now, those of you who've been listening for a long time know I got a deep, deep, passionate, burning love for the sport of basketball. My first love, basketball, I mean, I can't envision a life without it in some respect or another. But one thing I've been struggling with lately is playing pickup, finding a pickup run, something decent, something that I'm intrigued by, something that I feel included in, something that feels appropriate. Skill level wise, if you've really been paying attention throughout the past few months, I found a few runs, but honestly, it wasn't correct skill level wise. I was, I'm really not trying to sound braggadocious or anything like that, but I was just, it's just a fact of the matter. I was the best player at these runs and it wasn't because I was great. It was just because the kids that wanted to play with me were literally kids. They were like, the first group was like 18. The next group was in high school. And I was just picking the wrong times to go play. And it wasn't fun because I was just dominating. And I know, like, shouldn't that be fun? No, you like a challenge in life. I think you can relate everything in sport to a greater place. If you don't feel challenged within your sport, you're going to dominate, but it's not going to be fun. I mean... (laughs) You need a challenge. Greatest basketball player of all time, Michael Jordan. He could dominate with ease, but he wouldn't really turn it on unless someone challenged him like that. I mean, if you haven't seen the Doc Last Dance, you got to go check it out. But players would just talk some shit for no reason. He'd be having a cool game, a normal game. Second quarter, for some reason... A random player on the Nuggets or some shit like that would start going, chirping. And he'd be like, oh, you want Is that what we're doing? And he would just start dominating. It'd be too easy. He would have to challenge himself. Later in the doc, they revealed that he would make up stories about the other team to get in his own head to challenge himself. He would say stuff like, he would just make it up. He said, I heard such and such player on such and such team said I'm not all that to a varying extent and he would keep repeating that in his head and manifest that to be true in his own universe so then when he saw that player he had a vendetta against him that that player didn't even know about (laughs) now that's how to challenge yourself if you're dominating you can make it harder you can challenge yourself by doing stuff like that but obviously this relates out farther into the world if you don't feel challenged in your career you're not going to enjoy it as much You're going to coast, you're going to lose happiness, and you're probably going to find yourself 
thinking about the other stuff more so than whatever you're doing in your career. And obviously that career stuff's not uh not the only thing this implies because career is not everything, certainly not at all. Shoot, maybe you're a yoga practitioner. If you don't feel challenged by your flow, and I've run into this before, you got to go upgrade something. You got to start trying harder stuff. I mean, I've been implementing a headstand now. I've been trying to do a headstand for a few months now, and I basically have it, but I'm still challenged by it. And after I feel confident with my headstand, I got to move on to some other challenging pose that I got to be able to figure out and add into my my rotation. Or else it, I would still get the benefits. I mean, like, for example, playing in a basketball run where I'm dominating, you still get the benefits of exercise. I don't know, serotonin, ego boost, dopamine release, all that good stuff. Seeing the ball go through the net. Kids saying, oh, you can hoop. <laughs> That's my favorite because if you just look at me, what up, YouTube? I don't know if you would just consider, like, oh, this guy probably plays basketball. It's like, yeah, you might play, but I don't think people understand that I've put in 10,000 hours. <laughs> like, I'm actually nice. My biggest struggle on the basketball court would be the confidence of unleashing my true skills and getting into a rhythm and stuff like that. But that's neither here nor there. Bringing it back to what I was starting with, Gym talk. So I just been, I haven't been challenged on the court. So I just been doing a lot of shooting by myself. A lot of mid-range. I know these are detailed basketball stuff. I know not everybody cares. If you love basketball, I have a separate show dedicated to the sport. League Pass Buddies with my good friend, Theo Tyson. Groomsman at the wedding. Great guy. And we do a show every week and we're hitting a stride over there so if you love basketball if you want to hear all about these christmas day games and all that type of stuff even the pickup stories i just have to tell this one again here because it's so important in a greater thing throughout my life which is harnessing this confidence this ability to break some social anxiety right Because I definitely carry social anxiety. Like, I don't really know how to behave in a lot of social settings. Last night, I must have been around eight people I didn't know. Maybe seen a few times at various parties and events. And, you know, that's that's, that's difficult. I didn't go out of my way to, like, do conversations or anything like that. Like, that's just... You know what I mean? Uh, That's a social anxiety I got to figure out and how to do. But overall, I mean, I'm an only child. I'm a very introverted person. It's tough to break a shell on me. I stay in my world. You know what I'm saying? So that's a whole other story. But one way I've been really trying to work on overcoming this sort of uh, like sort of rejection, fear of rejection in a sense fear of being it's in previous episodes I got pretty deep but a fear of revealing my true self as like this incredible artist which I am but then having the person not accept what I do or not agree with what I do like that stuff's tough for me because I haven't had to come across a lot of rejection like that like here's my soul I've had relationships that dealt that way I mean I've only been broken up with in a sense in like serious relationship um obviously I'm at marriage like that at this point the I don't have to deal with that side of that anymore um I'm in a beautiful incredible best relationship ever But I'm just saying, drawn from my past, the only real rejections, I never was really rejected for like my art, like drawing stuff. I can only really imply, uh, you know, just like rejection in that sense. So like rejection therapy is a real thing, though. Like. Just having the ability to walk up and ask, like, um, so I'm doing it with basketball, let me. Pull the reins in. So in basketball, I'm like, last week, 
I was playing by myself. I was just hooping. I was shooting. I see a kid on the other court. It's maybe lunchtime on like a Tuesday or something. Like, like, all right, you seem adequate skill level. I'm just going to walk up to you and say, you want to play one-on-one? And I did. And that's tough for me to like get out of my little bubble. I could be so comfy, you know, being in my comfort zone, just playing by myself, headphones in, moving and grooving, dancing, shooting the rock, you know, just having a good time. But I went out of my way to go ask this kid to play one-on-one, and he said no. I'm like, okay, cool. (laughs) It's like, all right. That wasn't so bad. I mean, it hurt for a second. Like, why don't you want to play with me? But then after another second, it's like, hey, you don't want to play. I've said no to playing a lot. Ain't nothing wrong with that. And it just gets me in a better space. So then fast forward, I don't know, a couple days, uh, something like that. I show up later in the day. I stumble upon two, like, adults waiting on the side of a court. It looks like they're waiting for the court to free up. I walk over there, and I'm like, hey, y'all y'all about to play? And they're like, Yeah. Uh, we got a game. You want to play with us? You can play with us. You should play with us. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like a game game? Is there reps? And they're like, no, no, no. It's like a regular pickup game. We play every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, you can play with us. You should. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I, literally just after trying and failing once, the very next time I go out of my way to ask, I essentially get invited into this incredible pickup run that happens twice a week. So sure enough, I mean, I stayed, I played uh, maybe three games. I had a great time. Um, It was a good group of people. And that's what I'm going to keep doing. So now I have a pickup game. And it's good level, skill level. Everybody knows how to play basketball. That's the best part. But also there's people that I would confidently say are better than me at the moment. But I do believe that they are within reach if I keep challenging myself to improve within these games because I haven't really played a lot of head-to-head games like that in a long time so I'm excited it feels good and that's my gym story so shout out to the gym happy new year (laughs) but speaking of the new year I mean the new year is probably the best time to really recap what went down in this past year and I want to talk about a lot of things in the pop culture media world, I got my top albums. I got some uh, TV shows I really want to talk about. I've been dying to talk about it. I just keep forgetting to talk about them. We're going to get to that right after this quick break. And we are back. This week's presenting sponsor is, of course, without a question, without a doubt, without a single hesitation, That Rare Water Studios, baby, the illest, most beautiful representation of myself I've put onto clothing thus far. Creating clothes is about making cool shit, in my opinion. And in my opinion, ain't no shit cooler than mine. (laughs) So go ahead yourself to rarewaterstudios.com. Get yourself some beautiful pieces. New year, new pieces, obviously. But this first collection... The OG logo should be around, I mean, knock on wood, should be around forever, ever, like the Nike swoosh. But there may be a day where you don't see it again. You know, I study streetwear economics, essentially. I know the best way to make things desirable through hype, limited runs, these things. So while you can... Get yourself this type of stuff before maybe it don't exist. (laughs) But with that said, let's get back to the show. So, before I get into my top five albums, talking about some shows, etc., I do want to take some time to big up myself, essentially. Give myself some flowers. Do a a a year-end review of 2022. The year of synchronicity, the year of therapy, the year of healing, the year the year of growing. And I just kind of want to get into it because, I don't know, I, I felt like I did a lot this year. 
that I want to pat myself in the back for. So let's get into it. We start at the top of the year. My wife and I both turned 27. 27 is a beautiful age, right? I mean, we speak on it all the time here on this show, but representing the completion of the third cycle in life for looking numerologically, every nine years represents a cycle, your first nine years. You're very you're very young, super child, obviously. Then you go up to, through 18, it's a whole nother growing experience. You essentially grow into a full human, <laughs> but not mentally. I believe that work is done 18 to 27. You're always growing mentally, but obviously your frontal cortex actually finishes developing. You get to see what you're lining yourself up for in the future, and then you get to start your fourth cycle through the age of 36. So my wife and I both start this journey around the same time. She, January Capricorn, 14th, February Aquarius, the 9th over here. So that's how we started the year, ushering in the completion of 27 years of life, a celebration, a beautiful start, a loving, caring start. And interestingly enough, I was just scrolling through all my all my old pictures and stuff from the year. Literally February 11th, my first samples from my new service provider to help create and distribute my clothing articles, my garments, my garments here, essentially. <laughs> the first samples come to me the 11th of February. So literally two days after the start of this new cycle in my life. And I really only am putting that together right now, real time. Two days after the start of that cycle, the pieces start coming in. The pieces that I am growing on. The stepping stones, the 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 foundation is getting built literally right those two days so that was really cool to see <laughs> just looking back oh my powered by plants collection literally showed up my samples um february 11th and then released on my uh six years of veganism celebration on july 1st So what a time, you know what I'm saying? What a time. That's how we started the year. And just running through the year, I mean, podcast was churning. We get 2-22-22-22. I mean, it was a crazy day, February 22nd. We get into it in that episode, what power that entails, all this. And then we get into the crown chakra. I mean, there's some potent episodes in there. Go check them out. My catalog is ridiculous. If I do say so myself, I got all the goods. Just check it out. Go go back and be sure to rate five stars if you enjoy what you listen to. Be sure to leave a comment, review, whatever. If you're on Apple Podcasts, that helps tremendously. Thumbs up on YouTube helps tremendously. Subscribes help tremendously. You know the deal. In this content world, I got to say that spiel. <laughs> But from that moment, I mean, things started picking up, picking up pace. A lot went down. I mean, my my second run of samples came in huge. And right right when they come in, I do that trip I just talked about down to Houston, road trip across the country, see some of my best friends, do it with the best friend. I mean, it was great. Absolutely great time. Fly back. I mean, it was fun because it was also ushering in essentially a new incarnation on one of my best friend's lives, starting anew in a new city, moving from Southern New Hampshire to Houston. So seeing that, seeing how powerful it was and how correct it felt for him and his family, is like, yeah, yeah, it's important. You got to take that leap. You really got to if you feel as though you need to. Because just seeing the vibe change when we got there, it's like, oh, this makes sense for him. This is perfect. So we did that. 
moving on throughout the year. My samples were in. I'm pulling up. I'm actually scrolling through my memories right now, essentially. Got to see all my friends. Got all my samples. Oh, man. And then I, I did a thing. I actually started sharing for the first time my creations, Rare Water Studios, teasing them. I didn't quite know what they would be, where they would be encapsulated. I originally thought they would be going into my old label. But I've outgrown that label. And Rare Water Studios is the new home. And I came about that name later in the year. But essentially, I started sharing the stuff. So a few, few of my first pieces. And people started loving it. And I'm like, oh, this is different than everything I've ever created. Because I've created a lot of stuff and tried to sell it to the people. And I never received reactions like I was getting for the stuff that now is actually up for sale on rarewaterstudios.com. But I was seeing these reactions in, in April after publicly sharing for the first time. And it's like, oh, this is different. I like this. People actually like what I'm doing. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> so we keep going through the year. First time wearing this hoodie, sharing it with the people. I mean, this is just major moments for me. It might not seem like much, but it is. And then all of a sudden... Your boy takes his first international trip solo, solo dolo. And shout out to Absol. We get into that Herbert album very shortly. <laughs> but my first solo trip outside of the country. I mean, like, this is a huge moment for me. Being comfortable enough to do such a thing, to take that leap and book a trip. And shout out to my wife. I mean, it's weird that I would have to say she allowed me to go because we don't have that type of relationship. Like, it was more like her uh, her acceptance in allowing me to follow the passion to go on a solo trip is what's the most beautiful thing. Not that she allowed me to go because it's not like that. It's more like that she's like, oh, you should because... You've been wanting to do that. You've been wanting to go to the ancient pyramids, Chichen Itza. And guess what I did? I did. So booked myself a beautiful trip down to the Yucatan, you know. Had a great, great time. Rented a car in Cancun, flew into Cancun, but never never stayed more than a minute in that town. Drove down through the Yucatan all the way down to Tulum. Stayed on the outskirts of the city. Beautiful little Airbnb bungalow vibe. You know, drove all the way out to Chichen Itza, explored the ancient ruins, explored the ancient ruins of Tulum. I mean, oof. if you're ever in the city of Tulum, the town of Tulum, please do yourself a favor. I mean, I plugged her on the episodes I did back then when I went, but do yourself a favor and book the Airbnb experience with Tanya. You'll learn so much about the Mayan people and the Mayan culture that, like, you'll never stop talking about it. And I always bring it up <laughs> anytime I have a, a good reason to speak on the wisdom within the culture. It's, like, it's fascinating, fascinating stuff. So I had a great time. And that was such a wonderful experience to take that solo trip. The food, immaculate. Like, the food was incredible. I can't even, haven't had a taco come close <laughs> Besides the ones I make myself, like trying to make my own version of some of these tacos, I haven't had anything come close besides what I've done. Not not L.A., not San Diego. Nah. I mean, nothing came close. There was one restaurant in San Diego that had some that were like, oh, this is, this is good. But nothing came close to what I was having down there. I mean, that makes sense. It makes complete sense. But anyway, I wish I had more time. Um, I don't have a regret, but I, uh, I spoke on it during the podcast. If you go listen to the old ones, but I had one night where I was just tripping myself out essentially because I was all like worried that, I don't know, I was going to get, uh, stopped by the police while driving my rental. Cause there's mad stories of travelers running into that, having to accept or pay a bribe and all this. And I was so in my head, I was so anxious for no reason. I allowed all these negative reviews 
infiltrate my subconscious, get soaked by my subconscious and seep into my actual conscious mind. And it uh, manifested itself in one night of the trip, my last night of the trip, essentially unable to sleep, like just worried that like, I don't know, from my uh, little Airbnb bungalow getting broken into, that's not going to happen. It's really not going to happen. But I had just read a story about some like rich dude who bought a mansion and got murdered. Like none of that's going to (laughs) happen. Like it's a reality of the situation, but not of my situation. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I was tripping myself out. So I wouldn't say that's a regret, but it's a learning experience to not let things from my subconscious that could negatively affect my overall experience actually affect me. So working on that, growing as a human that way. And go listen to those episodes if you want more in-depth talk on that. But I can't wait to go back personally, uh, take my wife, and we get to do the same trip over again, essentially. But I got great news just last night, and like the synchronicity of it was wild. But um, my future sister, well, my current sister-in-law, but future brother-in-law, um, and shout-out to my brother, actual brother-in-law, too. Shout-out Adam. He had a great... A great Christmas Eve celebration. Got himself a new laptop. Creates the most incredible creation. So shout out to Adam. Um, I'm excited to see his his work, you know? Uh, but my future brother-in-law actually had never had a passport. And he just got his passport. And they're going on a trip. My sister-in-law and my future brother-in-law. They're going to Playa del Carmen, which is literally a town I drove through on my way to Tulum and vice versa on the way back from Tulum to Cancun. But they're going there literally in like a week and a half. So it's funny. I'm like, I didn't really think about recapping my year, but I was having a conversation with my future brother-in-law. And we were like, he was kind of talking about his year. It was a huge year for him. He did so much. He accomplished so much. And I'm super proud and excited for him. It probably sparked me looking into what did I do this year? Because I actually did a lot too, but I didn't really dive into it until right now. But the funny thing is they're going on this trip to start this new year. And it's just so exciting because he's never, he's never been able to leave the country. He hasn't had a passport. We talked about passports a couple episodes too. It's a wild system, but anyway, he's got his and they're going. So I'm so excited for them. And I hope to bring Talia on a similar trip um, to the one I took allow her to see these ancient ruins because they're like it changes it changes the way you think about stuff i mean the spiritual energy in these ancient ruins is insane especially when the culture was based on this connection to the universe i mean it's 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 written in the in the ground the way the the grounds are laid out at these ruins it's it's really really cool it's really trippy to see how connected to the earth, the earth itself, and obviously the the universe as a larger whole. I can't wait to get back down there. So that was just a huge moment actually going on that trip. And my passport, ladies and gentlemen, my real passport, I had to renew it. It's come in the mail and now I'm officially able to travel again. So who knows? I mean, you, I might do another solo trip in the next few months. Um, it's because it's probably time. It's probably time. I'll probably catch that bug in like a month. Uh, but anyway, as we move on through the year, you know, May wrapped up, May Day, that trip was the major thing. Tall and I went down to Houston to visit our friends and saw how well they were living. Just an amazing experience. And then in June, while I was on that trip down in Houston, I got a phone call about a walkthrough of the condo that was in my possession, that was going through all these renovations. If you're brand new to the story, I'm going to do the quickest wrap up ever. My mom passed away. I inherit, I'm the only child um, and divorced. So it's like, I'm. everything comes on to me. So the condo, when I came back, I guess I even have to add a little more detail. Um, she died three months before my wedding, almost exactly three months. Condo comes into my possession, obviously, the day she dies. But um, wedding, honeymoon, 
the condo is vacant for like three weeks. Come back to, you know, check on it, see what's going on. It's literally flooded and molded from like a backup problem, a backup leak problem. Something that ended up being the fault of the building itself that it was in. So it's a disaster. There's mold everywhere. Get a mitigation team in. It was a disaster. And that was the end of 21. So like literally November 21, December 21, mitigation. Like all this, the the condos ripped up. There's no walls anymore. So then all of the beginning of 22, I'm working with contractors. I'm working with... uh, the condo association trying to again go it's it's all in the show if you go look at descriptions of old episodes you'll be able to get the full story if you want but after this tenuous process the plan originally was like to sell it november 21 like right after the wedding that was priority one sell the condo but obviously that became impossible when it was all molded and I had to figure out how to rebuild it, but it was all it was all through insurance because it was the building's fault. So the building's for insurance got in. Again, it's all detailed. But anyway, on that trip to Houston, in June 22, I get a call that's literally like, "Hey, can are you around? Can we tour the place tonight? I have an interested buyer." It wasn't finished yet. It was still like a month away from being completed. Um, but there was a buyer that was interested off market. I was like, oh, this is a great opportunity, but I'm in Houston. Can we do a Monday the day I'm back? I'm like, yeah, sure. So literally that Monday, I'm thinking I'm just handing off the keys to the real estate agent. I meet up. It's the real estate agent. And I didn't know the buyer was with was with the agent, too. So I'm just like, I, I'm literally handing the keys over to the real estate agent to like, all right, do your thing. Give the tour, et cetera. But I'm thinking in my head, all right, I got to give the tour to the real estate agent so they know what to do. And then I find out the buyer is with them. So now I'm in like I'm in showman mode. And I'm like, all right, this is the place <laughs> I do the tour of the house. And the real estate agent, I'm going to be I'm going to be honest. I don't really think she sold much of anything. I think I sold the condo <laughs> like because I gave the tour. <laughs> so who knows? Maybe that uh, implies a future in doing home stuff. But um, for now, that's just a that's just a note on the year. But. I basically sold that house and sure enough, by the end of the week, there was a written offer for a great unrefusable price, such a good one that I didn't even want to take it to market. So we sold off market and I think in July or maybe the beginning of August, we closed and officially the condo situation was over and that was like, whew, that was huge. So also in late July, Tal and I took a trip to Montreal and that was just like, such a good, such a good vibe. I mean, my passport was expiring, I think in September. So we needed to do a trip together. We had a long weekend at Stout. I think it was maybe a four or five day trip. Montreal is like a four hour drive from our place, but such a good experience. I mean, it literally feels like you're traveling to a whole nother country. I mean, you are. <laughs> I get the the fallacy in what I just said, but or the, uh, I don't know if that was the correct word, but it was illogical what I just said. But Montreal is different than the rest of Canada. I mean, Quebec as a whole is so slept on. Such a good trip. I I can't recommend it enough, and especially in the summer, because it's a different world in the summer. We've done a bunch of trips in the winter there, but it's a different. Todd had never been in the summer. Actually, Oh my goodness, I'm realizing this now as I'm speaking. My first solo international trip ever was to Montreal on the on just the, the, the seam of my pants, however you say that phrase. I just decided one Friday afternoon, I gotta I wanna go to Montreal. So I just drove up. I didn't even have an Airbnb booked. It was truly as spontaneous as it gets. Um and that was my first solo trip. But I guess I don't count that because it was driving. Uh but yeah, it is another country. But I guess my first solo international flight trip was this one to Mexico. Mexico. Uh, La Peninsula de Yucatan. Yucatan. Anyway, my Spanish got awful after not being in a Spanish-speaking country. So anyway, we took a trip to a French-speaking area, and that Montreal trip was incredible. It's going to be living in my memories forever. We had such a great time. Went around the city, did all the all the touristy stuff, had some great food and just experienced incredible weather. We got a suntan in Montreal. Like it was such a good time. So I 
Oh man, that was awesome. Um, and then yeah, pushing into August, the house is sold. I'm like literally I'm feeling really good finally about everything um, going on. You know, I felt like that situation is finally behind me. It was kind of the last step in the the sort of the situation of the legal stuff that went with my mom's passing, which you don't really talk about in the death world. Like there's a lot, especially if you're the only person, but like going through all the paperwork, houses, all this stuff. So having that behind me was huge. And then moving into, I don't think much, too, too much happened in uh, August. I was mostly training, uh, looking through the pictures, just having good times, getting really into vinyl, which I did throughout the year, but I'm, um, my pictures here. I'm showing off my vinyl collection. So I got to see King Kendrick. Kendrick concert was phenomenal. Red Sox game. Just good stuff happening. Just having a good time. Um, and then I think the next monumental thing that happened was uh, I basically was training and trained, got myself ready to a point to go hike in California with my pops, but I ended up catching COVID. Um, Literally the second, the first day I landed in California, my head's a little cloudy. The next day I'm feeling not good at all. And the next day, um, test positive. And this was in September. So this whole trip that I had prepped for, trained for, been ready for, was excited to spend all this quality time with my dad um, out in California. The second it was supposed to happen, it couldn't. But moral of the story is we did end up having a great time together, even though we couldn't do this like big hiking trip. We ended up just having an incredible time and uh, spending quality time with each other, even though it was socially distanced. And I, I just love my dad and I love spending time with him. So it was still ended up being a net positive, even though we couldn't do the huge trip. I mean, the uh, adjustments he made for me like pushing back the start date a few days to hope myself was going to be in a going to be healed to start. I mean, it was a bummer, but it was good because I got to spend time with him every day. And that's awesome. I love that. And I uh, hope to spend more time with him in the future in some sort of sense. But that ended up failing. So I had to do my first emergency booking, essentially. <laughs> flights and all that and of course it came with the uh, the worst travel day I've ever experienced so I had incredible travel stories but then the worst travel day ever is being positive with COVID um unable to afford staying in a hotel to quarantine so having to you know jet back home that day a four plus hour bus ride packed bus ride with a driver that don't want to stop for uh bathrooms or nothing like that uh, obviously fully masked, but it's like a hundred degrees out. So just sweating, just, yo, it was crazy. It was honestly crazy. And then I got to the airport and mind you, I have all my hiking stuff. So I'm talking to a duffel bag. That's probably 50 pounds. I think it was 45 pounds. That's just my hiking stuff, let alone like my regular backpack. That's just like clothes and stuff for the times I wasn't hiking. Um, so I got all that stuff and then I go to check in the heavy bag I think I land at the airport or get to the airport at like noon. My flight's at like 8.30 p.m., but I have nothing else that I could do. And so I'm like, all right, can I check my bag? And they're like, ooh, you can't check your bag until four hours before the flight. And I'm like, what is happening here? So that travel day was awful. I'm just sitting on the floor at the airport all day. Can't do nothing. Can't, you know, take off my mask. Can't do anything. Um, and then obviously the flight gets delayed and it's just a disaster. But eventually I get home, heal up. And September goes uh, pretty much a month of healing. Something I should mention, I think in August or September, I think September or August, no, August, August, I started therapy. And this is huge for me. And I think this is going to sound funny, but um, late February, I started February, March, I started to make a TikTok and I found pretty quick success on it. Um, just applying my creative brain. I was making two TikToks a day and I found some quick success and eventually um, the highest I found was like a video that went pretty damn viral. I had a few go viral, but one that went extremely viral, nearly 4 million uh, views. And that was my intent. I was trying to get to this and I got it. Um, that happened in maybe 
May, that video popped off like crazy. But then eventually I wanted, I decided I needed to go to therapy. When I decided, made that decision, that was a whole thing. It's all on the show. Uh, right as I'm selling the house, it's kind of like, all right, all the hard work physically of my mom's passing I've put behind me. So now let's get into the emotional part of it. Let's go to therapy. So finally, I made the decision to go to therapy. And I can't even explain how good of a decision that was. I mean, I had such an incredible time doing it. And I recommend everybody goes to therapy if they can afford it or if they have a way to find help to get it. But it was a hassle to find my situation. But I I got in and I'm so glad I did because it's helped me tremendously. Um, And yeah, I spoke all about it in previous episodes. I kind of had to force my way in like she wasn't accepting new clients, but I literally wrote like a an essay, (laughs) a passionate essay on like, here's why I believe I should be one of your clients. And it's been incredible. It's been absolutely incredible. So that's a huge moment that I can't neglect. But interestingly enough, when I started uh, going to therapy weekly, um, I stopped doing TikToks. So I don't know. Maybe I'll re-implement the TikTok thing because it's important for this content culture to bring people into my universe, essentially, and get more eyes on what I do. I was in a good groove. I was catching rather regular virality. Um, So probably maybe I'll get back into that. But anyway, that was another thing I started therapy. And I can't I can't even express how much that's benefited me as well. Um, So then we move into another New York trip. We did. We probably went to New York two or three times that year um, this year. (laughs) Um, I, I finally understand it's Rare Water Studios. I make the logos for it uh i'm wearing my stuff more people are asking about it let's see we go into october one year wedding anniversary i mean you can't beat that just feel good i love our relationship um we do you know fun stuff in october go to a celtics game and then november november i decide to launch rare water studios right at the end of the year Woo! Potent, potent. Y'all have heard the whole journey. It's rather recent. If, especially if you listen all the time, you know what's happened recently. I launched my company, Rare Water Studios. We go to California and we get a glimpse of what life over there could be, which just seems like something we have to try and we probably will try. So the end of this 2022 gave us glimpses of the beginning of my company the beginning of a possible life surfing in San Diego, which I'm trying to manifest, and also implementing a regular manifestation practice into my life, adding that to the diet, adding that to the daily routine of all these incredible things from a gallon and a half of water a day, uh, plant-based, vitamins, getting all my minerals, doing all this good stuff, yoga every day, meditation every day. Now we add a manifestation to it as well. We add in all these tools to try to make ourselves the best human we can be. And when I say we, that's the collective community, y'all. Sending y'all peace, love, and positivity. <laughs> what a 2022. Let's have a good 2023, humans, aliens, another. So without further ado, drum roll, please. I think it's a perfect time to get into what I consider my top five albums of the year. I kind of just want to breeze through them real quick because... I think I'm going to go more in-depth on League Pass Buddies, but I'll give y'all a minorly in-depth situation here. I've got I've got two honorable mentions, um, three honorable mentions, Un Verano, si, <laughs> Un Verano Sin Ti, the Bad Bunny album. I mean, it's really good. Honorable mention, it's really good. I've got D-Day, the Dreamville Gangsta Girls mixtape. And Spino said on a that he's gonna have a Gangsta Girls mixtape. So I'm looking forward to that. We talk about all the time how good that the most recent Spino mixtape is. She already decided. So to hear Gangsta Girls with what he can do on a mixtape, I mean I'm excited. So anyway, that Dreamville D-Day mixtape is in there. And then the most recent addition to the uh 
honorable mentions is The Sacred Souls, the EP The Sacred Souls. It might be number five by the time I make my uh, official list on a Friday with my guy Theo because I asked him to get his list together. But as for now, it's going to be an honorable mention. At number five, honestly, never mind. <laughs> no, that's the name of the album. <laughs> a dance album from this generation's biggest hip hop artist. Biggest, not, I'm not saying uh, most talented, although he is top three most talented. Um, Drake making a dance album is like, jeez. <laughs> I didn't know I needed this, but I needed it. We talk about it when it came out, but it just reminded me of my honeymoon in Greece. And it seems like everybody that has done some sort of Euro trip, that album encapsulates it perfectly. But like, it sounds like it sounds like uh, my honeymoon did. All the al- all the music that was on the radio it was just good vibes. It felt like a vacation. So when I listen to that album, it feels like a vacation. And it had just come out literally right before our trip to Montreal. So again, it felt like a vacation. Whenever I listen to that album, it takes me back to the trip to Montreal, which is why it makes it feel so special, right? Like music takes you to certain times in your life and it makes it feel special. So honestly, never mind is my number five. Taking us to number four. Maybe the first time this has happened, at least in my current memory, a, a two, a two pack. Drake enters my top five again with her loss with 21 Savage. I mean, this this album's incredible. I didn't think I'd be saying that when it came out. You know what I mean? Like, I had expectations for it, but they were sitting around uh, what a time to be alive expectations, which were incredible for the moment. I still really love that album, but I don't know if it's like an all-time thing for his catalog. But her loss, though? This album's incredible. I love it. I think Privileged Rappers is my favorite song. Uh, That and then Middle of the Ocean. Middle of the Ocean was my favorite, but I really think it's Privileged Rappers now. It's just like, it's such a good song. But anyway, yeah, that's my number four. Number three is the newest album to come out on this whole list, Herbert Absol. I wouldn't be surprised if it sneaks its way up this uh, list by the end of next year. You know, I like I normally like to do top fives a year or two removed. Um, so you have time to sit with all the music for situations like this exact situation <laughs> where an album that came out last week is in my top five. But it has to be because Absol, artist I feel more connected to with than almost any artist. This out al- this album really peeling back the layers of himself and actually showing you more of who he is as a human as opposed to this being that taught all this third eye knowledge, all this sacred wisdom, all this sacred knowledge, similar to situations that I've been talking about a couple episodes ago, talking about the Oracle card that I drew that I, it says the same thing, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. I'm loving Herbert. Favorite track thus far? I really like Church on the Move. I like Gotta Rap. Go Off's great. Gangnam's maybe like the the illest beat of the year, maybe. Moon Shooter, obviously. Message in the Bottle, No Report. I mean, the whole album's incredible. I think I like every single record. But again, it just came out a week ago. So it's so tough to like really give in-depth on it. But my number two, I can give psh, without a doubt. I mean, this was this is like 1B. This is really tough choosing between my top two. It's 1B, 1A. But if I have to give one B slot, Smino Love for Rent, perfect album. I, there's no skips on this for me. Top to bottom, the skits are perfect. It's the most perfect flow album ever. Like it just seamlessly connects itself track after track. It's perfect. It feels like you get five different genres on this, but it doesn't seem disconnected at all. I mean, it's tough to eat, like pr- sh- like choose one song from here because the whole album is, it feels like you have to listen to the whole thing at once to really get it. But I really, I really love Garden Lady. <laughs> like, I really love Garden Lady. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's one of my favorite songs maybe ever. I love that song. Um, Defibrillator is incredible. 
Matinee, Blue Billy, Luforio, Last Kendrick, Pro Freak, 90 Proof, Noels. I mean, at literally every song, Settle Down, Pudgy, Curtains, Pudgy, and Lizzy got some power on it. Like, <laughs> I mean, who in the trunk would have I, I love that album, but the only thing that I would have ahead of it, number one, I think it's obvious. I mean, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, maybe the the most open album from a major artist like this that I've ever had the the experience of indulging upon. Like this album takes you through the whole gamut of emotions in a way that I've never experienced. Throughout listening to the whole hour and 13 minutes of this double LP, literally a double LP, it's two nine track albums mirrored in meaning and depth and it's so it's Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers but the album's also a mirror it's all it's all about looking yourself in the mirror so the first half even though you would think it's Mr. Morale it's actually the Big Steppers half so this is about the ego this is about the the pride this is like I mean if you look at damn it talks about all these topics as well but this is a further in-depth analysis of these things anyway so that first half, the big steppers, it's all, it's all about, you know, machis- you get the machismo and father time talking about father-son relationships and how that works. And you get We Cry Together talking about a toxic relationship um, with a man and a woman. Like, I'm sure we've all experienced a toxic situation. Um, you go through throughout the whole out. I mean, M95 speaking on the current situation as a metaphor, talking about the N95 mask and instead of just who you are as a person, take off all the masks that you're trying to be. Just be yourself. That's what it's all about. United in Grief. I, the, the opening track of the album, I grieve different. I mean, uh. <laughs> you get a massive hit like Die Hard, Rich Spirit, Incredible, Purple Hearts, Incredible. And then the second half of the album, the morale half, this is really about like diving deep into that self-growth. I mean, the whole album is, but this part, like count me out and just like, (laughs) that might be my favorite album on this whole thing or my favorite song on the whole thing currently. I love when you count me out. (laughs) My name is in your mouth. (laughs) Crown. I mean... Silent Hill is probably a lot of people's favorite record on the album as it's aged. Uh, pew, 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 pew. <laughs> savior taking off the mask that he put as this savior complex that we all kind of view Kendrick as, at least guys like me who view him such a high light in my youth. It's like, oh, this guy, he can help us all by sharing this information. Uh, but he renounced that. You know what I'm saying? And that was a beautiful song. Uh, Auntie Diaries. I mean, what more can I say? Mr. Morale, what more can I say? I mean, that that song takes you through the emotional journey of just like, <laughs> like you really, you get up on it. It's it's passion. It's, it's anger at the situation that has been placed upon life here, right? Like, it's crazy. And then Mother I Sober, I mean, I cry listening to this damn near every time. Um, Incredible record. Finishing with Mirror. I mean, yeah, this is the number one album of the year. For me, in his catalog, this is already higher than most people have it in uh, theirs, at least from what I've seen. I love this record. I can confidently say I have it over Good Kid. Like, I can confidently say that. I know that's kind of blasphemous, but for me, this hits more buttons. The, The depth. This is a grown man album. Like you gotta be ready to tackle these co- these topics, these concepts, and that's what I've been doing myself. I mean, going to therapy. Literally, this album was a driving force in me deciding to go to therapy, lining up with everything else I spoke on throughout this episode. I mean, this album helped push, and then seeing the show live was like it's a top five concert for me easily. This tour was absolutely phenomenal. Then Keem came out and did his thing too. So it's definitely my number one. Um, I can without a doubt say that. Number one album of the year, Mr. Morale and the Big Severs. Now before ending, ending the show, there's been two 
two uh, other things in the entertainment world I want to touch on real quick. One being uh, this show called Last Chance You. It's a basketball show. And I know I said basketball stuff on the other show, but such a good show. If you really want to dive into the mentality of someone who's got to, it's all on this one thing. That show kind of shows it all. I just I recommend that for anybody who, you don't even need to be a basketball fan to love that show, but it helps. So, oh, and they they use the song, uh, uh, Miss Morale in the in the show. So yeah, go listen to that. Anyway, um, that show is incredible. But really, we just finished watching the fourth and final season of Atlanta, and I think. I think in my mind, it's a top five show of all time. That's another episode, but I don't want to spoil anything. But like, if you haven't finished watching Atlanta yet, go watch the the ending or, or catch yourself up. If you like maybe have only seen the first two seasons and then didn't really realize the third and fourth season came out over the last two years and it just finished a couple weeks ago. This is literally a top five show of all time for me. Like, it's up there with Curb. <laughs> I don't know, it's different worlds, but really not, because the hilarity that's sewn into the seriousness of Atlanta, like, you'll have laugh out loud laughing moments in the most absurd situations, because it is surreal kind of landscape that, um, you know, Donald, Donald Glover and Hero, the director, Hero Mirai, I believe I'm pronouncing his name correctly um have captured within the show it's just like it's a perfect show uh, it, it's so deep there's so much social commentary there's so much life lessons and things like this just woven into it perfect show I highly suggest you watch it and I think without further ado that's gonna be it we're gonna tap out here um, I'll do a top five shows of all time. I want to. I, I want to talk about the finale of Atlanta really bad, but I just don't want to spoil it. So <laughs> I'm gonna wait for people to catch up, maybe a month or two, and I'll actually dive into it. Um, with that being said, y'all, what a year! I think the next time I drop will be 2023. So this has been episode 120 of the Bobby Keep Podcast. Send it, y'all. Peace, love, and positivity. Humans, aliens, and others, thank you for tuning in. Peace.